Hi. Um, so yeah, I want to start off t saying that um, this talk is based on my dissertation research, and so there are a lot of important ethical questions around genetic testing for ASD, some of which I explored in my research. But today, I'm really focusing on the healthcare disparities and the justice issues when offering genetic testing. So in thinking about this and in thinking about the two cases I'm about to present to you, um, I felt like there were four really important ethical questions to look at. And they are looking at the benefits of offering genetic testing to families, and then how should providers talk to families about this, knowing that sometimes this testing is not covered by insurance. Should it be offered on a case-by-case -case basis? And then if we are doing that, if we're offering it in a case-by-case -case basis, how can we do that in an equitable and fair way? So the first, like I said, there's going to be two case examples I'm going to talk about. And the first one uh, is a 22-year-old patient. She's African-American. She goes to a genetics clinic, and her parents were present at the time. I was in, in uh, observing this clinic visit. She had had previous genetic testing done when she was about 10 years old, and the parents were not clear on what type of testing that was, but from the discussion, it sounded like she probably had a, a karyotype done at that time. Um, at this time, she's now being referred to genetics from her neurologist, um, and the geneticist is recommending um, testing at this time, uh, array testing be done because of the improved technology and the hope to find an etiology for this um, ASD. Um, I interviewed the family later, and it was clear in my interview that the family was still not clear about what exactly was offered, why it was offered, why they were having testing done, but they really felt like they wanted to do what was being recommended, and so they were going to have the testing done, and they were going to have it done while uh, the patient was sedated for other procedures. When they showed up to get that done, um, they were then informed that their insurance would not cover it, so they never had the testing done. The second case is a uh, two-year-old Caucasian male patient who just recently was diagnosed with ASD. Um, they saw a developmental pediatrician. The developmental pediatrician did not offer any form of genetic testing. However, the mother came into the, important, the appointment knowing about genetic testing and really seeking out testing. She wanted to know about reoccurrence risk and she wanted to know what the cause was. Um, the provider was hesitant to do array testing and so suggested Fragile X testing instead. The Fragile X testing was done, which came back negative, and then the provider again suggested no further testing, but the parents really, really pushed the issue, citing the importance of reoccurrence risk knowledge, and so they did go through, pushed it through insurance, and in this case, insurance covered the majority of the cost of the test. The family was in a good financial position to pick up the remainder of the cost. The family had the testing done, and the test confirmed for them um, an etiology for their child's ASD. So what we see here, and what we've seen over the past two days, is people's journey, once an ASD diagnosis has been made, are very different. Lots of people experience different, some people are waiting for a long time, some people are quickly seen by others, some people see many providers, some people don't see um, anybody except the initial provider. And so the pathway from a diagnosis to genetic testing is not different than anything else. It's, it's really dependent on each family, on their experience, where they live, who they see, what kind of insurance they have, how they react to the diagnosis, what kind of questions they ask. The list goes on and on. And for all the families that I spoke with, and I should say that my, my research was a qualitative um, interview with 14 families, and each of these families had very unique experiences. I mean, we keep hearing that again and again. Everybody's family experience is very different, and genetics is no different. So looking at genetic testing in the clinical setting, let's it's a very complicated issue. Um, it's complicated by what types of tests are offered. We already just saw in the two cases. In the one case, Fragile X was offered. In the other case, Array was offered. In the past, karyotyping has been offered. So different tests can be offered. Um, and then under what circumstances to offer them? Do you do it for everybody? Just blanket everybody who has an ASD diagnosis is offered these tests, or is it on a case-by-case 
basis. And then who decides? Is it the families that are deciding? Are the providers deciding? Is the insurance companies deciding because they're deciding on what gets paid for? And because there's no specific therapeutic action based on those results, clinical utility is still very much open for debate. So again, this could be offered by the diagnostic provider or it could be offered by a pediatrician. They could then be referred to a specialist who offers it or referred to the specialist then refers them to a geneticist and then they're the ones who offer it. There's no one set path. Um, most often, currently, chromosomal microarray is the test that's being offered. And for those of you who are not familiar with this, um, this is a test that looks at copy number variants. So these are small changes in DNA, and they see they are looking for deletions, duplications, insertions. These results are very complex. So a family could get a result back that says, yes, we found a copy number variant, but it's of uncertain clinical significance. It could be attributing to the ASD or it could not. Um, interpretation is very complicated, to say the least. It's highly variable and it's dynamic. I'm just going to look really quickly um, at these, uh, talk really quickly about these guidelines that are out there. Um, and these are the five guidelines I looked at during my dissertation research, but I really want to focus on two of them. And the two that I want to talk about today is the recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics, which came out in 2007, not very current, but it's the only guideline that's available from them. And in their recommendation, they recommend a karyotype and fragile X for all ASD. The other recommendation I want to talk about is the American College of Medical Genetics, and they offer, they recommend um, the array testing, fragile X testing, and then these two other very specific gene tests, again, for all individuals who are diagnosed with ASD. So going back to our two case examples, in the first case, we see a patient who goes and, and speaks with a geneticist. That geneticist is following the recommendation from the American College of Medical Genetics to have the array testing done. But the problem here is there is a discrepancy between what is recommended and then what families or insurance will pay for. So this family wanted to follow the recommendation, but then didn't because insurance wouldn't cover it and they couldn't, cover the, they couldn't pay for the cost themselves. Um, I, I think it's true, but I, I think that one thing to point out here is that it is very important that providers are communicating with families and explaining to them the risk and benefits of the tests and explaining that insurance doesn't always cover it. This should be communicated ahead of time because in my interview, this family did not understand that. In the second case, uh, when the family saw a developmental pediatrician, this provider was following closer to the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines, had decided to offer the Fragile X testing, um, but then when that came back negative and the family really, really, really pushed to get the microarray testing, the provider said, okay, fine, we'll put it through and see if your insurance covers it, which they did. So we see here two very different outcomes. One was offered testing, but then didn't get it because of lack of insurance. Uh, the other family wasn't offered testing, but because of education and, per and pushing through, ended up getting the testing. So that brings us back to these two, or these four ethical questions. Um, we've got two very different cases, two, two different outcomes, two different situations. And I really want to come back to looking more close, closely at these four questions. So I'm going to break them down. So the first question, what are the benefits and burdens of offering genetic testing to families? So these, this is, these are not exhaustive, but this is, what, this is what I learned from talking to patients, and I also interviewed 15 providers in my interviews. And these were the lists of benefits and burdens that came out. So if we look at case A, um, they didn't have any benefits because they didn't have the testing done. Would there have been benefits had they done the testing? That's questionable. Um, but they have very little burdens as well. There was a burden of a waste of time and energy, perhaps, and perhaps some added uncertainty because they were so unclear about why they were getting the test and why 
you know, if why insurance didn't cover it and if they should follow up on that, they, they really weren't certain. For case B, um, this parent cited the first four benefits as huge benefits for her. They found a cause for their child's um, ASD. They found a support system. That she found a group of other individuals with the same diagnosis and really found this tight community that she bonded with and felt support from. She found providers who were familiar with this diagnosis and really she felt like she had a much better handle on disease management. She felt a lot less guilt. She felt like she was empowered to make good decisions for her child's care in the future. And for her there was very little burden. But again I want to stress that that's kind of the rare case. So what should providers do when they're discussing this with parents? We see a real lack here in three areas. There's a lack of consensus on the standard of care, and this is from providers individually and from the guidelines. There's a lack of parental awareness, which we saw. Parents don't understand this process. And there's a lack of insurance coverage, which we see as well. So what can providers do? I mean, they individuals, providers can't really deal with one and three. But they can take the time to give a more careful explanation of the benefits and burdens. They can go over why this test is being offered, what will come out of this testing, let parents know that this may or may not be covered by insurance, and help parents to make a better decision for what they want to do for themselves and their, dis and their children. The next question, should it be offered to every family or on a case-by-case -case basis? This is a tough one because, because of the variability in provider attitude and practices, it's hard. There's not consensus on, on who should be offered it and in what circumstances. But the truth is, almost every parent I spoke to is searching for an answer, right? Everyone wants an answer. Providers want an answer. So if everybody wants an answer and genetics has the ability to possibly give you an answer, even in a small cases, Everybody's going to want to go for that, well, in most cases. Parents are really searching. They want to help their children. And if their physician is recommending something that could possibly help them or give them an answer, most cases they're going to take it. Um, but then providers see ethical concerns with routinely offering this when there is still questionable clinical utility to offering this test. So if we're going to offer it in a case-by-case -case basis, how do we do that in an equitable way? So if it, it doesn't really give a benefit, does it matter that some people are being offered it and some people aren't? Is, is that really an issue? Some people would say, well, if there is no benefit, then why does it matter that some people are being offered it and some people aren't? To me, it feels wrong that it feels like there's a real justice issue when the people that are able to get the test are the people that have insurance that have the education to understand the test, that have the financial resources to do that. There's something wrong about that. And we, we've talked all day yesterday about these disparities, disparities in diagnosis and in treatment. And we need to be cognizant of exacerbating these disparities that already exist. And so genetic testing is just one more thing that adds to that disparity. Um, and these current policies that say, okay, everybody should be tested, this is a problem when insurance is not lining up with that and that certain people are able to get the testing while others aren't. And it's, if we're going to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, shouldn't we come up with an algorithm of, like, these are the cases that get offered it and for these reasons, not just because, well, because the parents push for it and they've got the financial resources to do that. So... And looking at lessons for the future, I think the important things to note is that these two cases demonstrate an access to care issues, ambiguity in whether genetic testing should be offered, and there's some real gaps in knowledge. For providers, you've got this broad range of opinions that extends into the clinical guidelines, and I think the reason there's such a broad range of opinion is because it stems from a lack of definitive evidence supporting this test. Um, and so it's what everybody says after every presentation, right? We need more information, which that's just the way it is. And I also think that there's been a real lack of research around 
trying to understand the parents' perspective. Do parents want this test? Do they understand this test? What are their thoughts on that? And that's why I did the research that I did when I started looking at this issue. There was very little information about parents' thoughts and feelings on genetic testing. Um, my research touched on that a little bit, but it was just the tip of the iceberg. I think we really need to understand parents' perspectives much better. And so to wrap it up, my personal opinion is that genetic testing for ASD moved from research into clinical care before the ethical implications were really considered. But unfortunately, the cat is out of the bag. Genetic testing is being offered, and I find it difficult to see how we're going to put it back in. Um, so what do we do moving forward? I think there's things that can be done. So providers, I think the thing that individual providers should do is they should be aware of these potential disparities. They should be more transparent and more communicative with parents on the benefits, the burdens, the lack of insurance coverage, and really sit down and try to make parents understand. It's a complicated issue, but you can at least try to help parents understand all this. Um, I think policymakers really need to revisit the policy policies on this and to clarify what the purpose of genetic testing is. And so for families, um, I think families need to um, insist on accurate information. And if they find out that genetic testing is not offered uh, or not covered by insurance, they need to figure out whether it's a useful um, thing to spend time and money on getting this test. Thank you. And I just want to acknowledge and thank um, my um, PhD I got from the Institute of Public Health Genetics, and this is my dissertation committee that was very supportive, and my uh, research was funded through NHGRI. Thank you.